6, and we'll read verses 7 through 13 from Mark chapter 6. And he, in reference to Jesus, called the twelve to him and began to send them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper in their money belts, but to wear sandals and to not put on two tunics. And he said to them, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place. And whoever will not receive you nor hear you when you depart from there, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Saddam and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So they went out and preached that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with many and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. May the Lord bless me to his word and be sanctified in our hearts. Father, we thank you for your word. Open it to us today that we might behold the Lord Jesus Christ afresh and anew and see him in transcendent glory, majesty, and might and power. And may that man, that woman, that boy or girl never come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hear clearly the gospel today that Christ died for their sins according to the scripture, that he was buried and raised from the dead on the third day according to the scripture, and that whoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved today, and that they can be saved by calling upon the name of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> I want to talk this morning from the subject of Jesus deputizes the 12. Jesus deputizes the 12. How many in, of you here this morning are fans of the Andy Griffin and Mayberry show? So y'all all, all uh, dating yourselves up in here. One of my favorite comedies of all time is Andy Griffin, the Andy Griffin Show, when they were in Mayberry, when Barney Fife was his right-hand man, his right-hand deputy. And Barney and Andy had been childhood friends, and they grew up right there together in Mayberry. And nobody had any confidence in Barney at all but Ange. And Andy made Barney his, his deputy, right-hand man. Gave him a uniform, a badge, a gun, and one bullet. <laughs> Which he couldn't put in the gun. He had always cut a bullet in his, in his shirt pocket. And so I didn't want Barney to shoot himself. He wasn't so concerned about shooting someone else. But every time that Andy would get ready to go out of town, Barney would grab his shoulders back and stick his chest out because he was going to be sheriff for a day. Now, I remember one particular episode that Andy laid out to Barney exactly what he wanted to do, just keep everything under control. Mayberry was running uh, like a fine oiled and greased machine. No sooner than Andy got out of Mayberry, Barney had arrested Goober, put him in jail. Arrested the mayor, put him in jail. Arrested Floyd, the barber, put him in jail. Arrested Aunt B and Opie and put him in, him in jail. As a matter of fact, Barney had the whole town arrested. When Andy got back, the streets were almost like a desert and everything was peaceful and tranquil. Andy was feeling pretty good by himself, about himself and about Barney's uh, performance until he stepped into jail. And everybody's locked up in jail as a, rest, as a, as a result of Deputy one day share a fight. Now here was the problem. The problem was that Andy was a seasoned, reasonable, cool, calm, collective, even kill with excellent judgment share. And he had the maturity to be able to function without even wearing a gun in Mayberry. It did not matter that Andy would deputize Barney and say he was a sheriff in his action, in his absence. 
What Andy could not do, he could not put his wisdom, his skills, his ability to reason and to rationalize and to make decisions, he could not put that inside of Barney. Even though Barney was with him almost every day, he watched him, he observed him, he saw how Andy was able to manage Mayberry, but Andy really could not put inside of Barney what was inside of him. Now, except for the Holy Spirit of the living God, we'll be just like Barney Fife, trying to live our Christian lives. We'll be fum bumbling around with our badge and with our gun and with our one bullet and probably shooting our own selves in the foot. But the difference between Andy and Barney is the difference between day and night in terms of ability. And there's even a greater difference between the Lord Jesus Christ and us than there exists between Andy and Barney Fife. In the text before us this morning, I think it is a fitting and apt title of Jesus deputizes the twelve, his apostles, his disciples. But it's important for us to understand the context of this deputization that takes place. And if you're here on last week, you'll recall that Jesus returned to his hometown, Nazareth of Galilee, after a very successful, spectacular ministry time in a place called Capernaum. And so he comes home, and the Bible says that the people were offended at him. They were impressed by his wisdom. They were impressed by his works. They were impressed by his ability to handle the scripture. But they were offended. They were caught up in a knot of their unbelief. They could not reason as to where he got all of the wisdom and the mighty works that he performed because he was nothing more than the carpenter from Nazareth of Galilee. He was nothing more than the brother of James, of Joseph, and Judas, and his mother, Mary, and his sisters were all there. And so their doubt cast this dark shadow of his ministry. So the Lord could not do many works there because of their doubt. And we said on last week that God can and will overlook ignorance, but he will not overlook unbelief. If we few refuse to believe and trust and put our faith in God, first of all, we cannot be saved. We cannot be saved by inheritance. We cannot be saved by some spiritual pedigree that has been passed down to us from our mother, our grandmother, our father, our grandfather. We can only be saved by putting our faith in the person and in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. God can and will overlook our ignorance but he will not overlook our unbelief. And so he would not overlook their unbelief. And the Bible says here in Mark chapter six, something it only says in one other place that Jesus was astounded by their unbelief. It said he, was, he, he marveled, he was amazed. It's the same word that was used to describe his response to the centurion who had the servant that was ill. And Jesus said, let me come to your house that I might lay my hands on him and heal him. And, the centurion said, Lord, that is not necessary. You just speak the word and he will be healed. And the text says, Jesus marveled. He said, I've not seen that type of faith. No, not in all of Israel. Now he marvels at their unbelief. He is dumbfounded by the fact they've witnessed the miracles, the healings. They've heard the profound, insightful teaching, yet they still refuse to believe. And in response, Jesus said that a prophet has honor everywhere except in his own country, in his own house, and among his own kin. And he was restricted in the amount of miraculous work he could do there. If that is the context of the next verse. Because after being rejected in his own town by his own country, by his own household, and by his own kin, Jesus realizes that people still need to hear the gospel. So after they rejected him, he then goes to plan B. Look at verse 7. And he called the 12 to him and began to send them out. You see, if people will not hear you, if they will not respond to you, then maybe they will respond to one of your deputies. If you have deputized someone, if you have discipled someone, if you have won somebody to faith, 
If someone believes in the Lord Jesus Christ as a result of your witness and your testimony and you have discipled them, then they have the ability to become a more effective witness than you in some quarters. Some of the people that are too familiar with you and may not hear or listen to you, they may listen to someone else. And so what Jesus does, he calls the disciples to himself, he deputizes them, and now he's going to send them out, and this is almost this one last opportunity that he's going to extend to try to save his own hometown before he leaves forever. So he sends them out. Now watch what happens. In verse 7 of Mark 6, he says, And he called the twelve to him, and he began to send them out two by two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. He commanded them to take nothing for their journey except their staff, no bag, no bread, no copper for their money belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. Now, if you were to turn to Matthew chapter 10, both Matthew, Mark, and Luke gives us a rendition of this particular narrative. Matthew gives us a little bit more detail. In Matthew 10, 1, he says basically the same thing, and when he called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases. He then named the 12, and then in verse 5 it says, These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now watch this, this little detail that Matthew offers that Mark doesn't. Matthew offers the detail of Jesus told them, do not go into the way of the Gentiles. Do not go into the way of the Samaritans. You only go and preach to the Jews. Mark omits that. Let me tell you why I think Mark omits it, but why it's important. Mark omits it because Mark was writing primarily to a Gentile audience. So Mark is not wanting to offend the Gentiles. If Mark includes this particular part of their saying they couldn't go to the Gentiles, they couldn't go to the Samaritans, then he would have to go into a long explanation as to why they weren't supposed to go to the Gentiles and they weren't supposed to go to the Samaritans. And that was not his purpose there. His purpose was not to give them a great theological doctrinal lesson. His purpose was to expose them to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They would have been offended if they heard this early in Mark's gospel that for some reason God had showed partiality toward the Jew and that he had given him a preference over the Gentile, which God actually does, in fact. The reason Matthew includes it is because Matthew is writing primarily to a Jewish audience. And so Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience, and Matthew wants them to understand that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Messiah. He, he came to fulfill the promises that God had already given to the nation of Israel. So he came to offer them the kingdom of God. And so Matthew established in his gospel that, yes, the gospel was to go to the Jew first and then into the Gentile, that God had not reneged on his promises to the Jews that they still had a unique place in God's plan and in God's economy, and that there was still this kingdom that God had promised to them. So Matthew has to establish when he's writing to the Jews, God has not forgotten you and the promises that he made to you. Mark does not include that because Mark said that is not germane to the, to the argument I'm making to the Gentiles. The argument I'm making to them is that God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of Jesus Christ, is also their Savior as well. Let me tell you why Matthew puts in this part about don't go to the Gentiles. Because had the apostles went to the Gentiles and the Samaritans first, then the Jews would not have even listened to them. They would not even given them audience because the Jews in their spiritual and racial feelings of superiority felt that the Gentiles were so far beneath them had they taken the gospel to the Gentile first, then the Jews would not even give them any audience or any hearing. So they had to go to the Jew first. That's just a little bit of theological side work you need to understand and know. That everything that's in the Bible is there for a purpose. Everything that's not in the Bible is not there for a reason. So Mark doesn't include it because he's not going to offend the Gentiles. 
and his goal is not to give them a great theological lesson to present Jesus Christ as Son of God. Matthew has to include it because he doesn't want to offend the Jews. He wants them to understand that God is still the God who fulfills his promises. Now watch what both of them establishes. They both established this, the priority over preaching the gospel. That they were to declare and to preach the gospel. Both Matthew says it, both Mark says it, and you read in Luke's account of Luke, in Luke chapter 9, Luke says the same thing. That he sent them forth that they might preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. That is to be the priority. And it must always remain the priority of the church. The church always has this pressing priority to make clear and succinct the good news of the gospel of the grace of God. All the other things we do have their place and they have their purpose and choirs have their place and their purpose and missions groups have their place and their purpose and the different groups and the different organizations. But our priority is always we're trying to create a platform, a venue that the gospel might be preached, that the gospel might be declared, that people might understand that they are severely lost without Jesus Christ. And that there is an urgent need for them to come to themselves and recognize that they are undone, dead in trespasses and sins, and they need to turn away from their own way and trust Jesus Christ as their personal savior. He sends them forth that they might declare and preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now this will also help us to understand some other things that he tells them not to do. If you're there in Matthew, Matthew chapter 10, you look at verse 9. He says, provide neither gold, nor silver, nor copper in your money belts, nor, nor bag for your journey. No two tunics, no sandals, no staffs, for a worker is worthy of his food. Now, why would he tell them not to take anything? There are two reasons. There are two reasons. The first reason is that Jesus' ministry had been defined by what? What was his ministry defined by? Second, the preaching and teaching. By miracles. By miracles, and so the people were accustomed to seeing miracles take place, and they also know that Jesus had the power to provide a miraculous way, and so what he's wanting to establish in the ministry of the apostles is that their priority first is the preaching of the gospel, not the dissemination of bread and loaves. That's not their priority. Bread and loaves, dissemination has a place. Helping the poor with the physical need has a place, but it's not the priority. It is secondarily to the preaching of the gospel. So when he sends them out, he wants them to be established first and foremost as heralds of the gospel, as preachers of the gospel. So he said, don't even take any money with you so when people ask you to give you a dollar, when you tell them I ain't got it, you won't be lying. Don't even take two coats with you, so when someone say, I'm about to freeze to death, give me your coat, you say, I can't do it because I don't have but one on, and beneath me, I would be undressed. He wants them to make sure that they maintain and establish this priority of their ministry is to preach the gospel. Because people can have a belly full of food and drop into hell from a heart attack. And people can be dressed and attired in designer clothing and fall dead and die without having heard the gospel. So he says we establish the priority of the preaching of the gospel. That is why that's one of the reasons that he told them not to take any material things with them so that they would not be confused with the Union Mission or the Mountain Mission or the Salvation Army or the Red Cross. They would be known as those that preach the good news of the gospel of the grace of God. And people have the right to reject it if they want to. Are you with me? That's the first reason. We'll come to the second reason in a moment. So first of all, they're to declare and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Secondly, they're to demonstrate and to display the power of God. You, you continue to see this resurface 
in the ministry of Jesus. We saw it early in Mark's first five chapters. Jesus first establishes his authority. He establishes authority with his preaching and with his teaching, with his knowledge of God, his knowledge of God's word, his ability to apply the word of God with laser precision that touched on the hearts, the minds, and the emotions of the people, and they felt like he was speaking only to them. And so they were amazed with his authority. But then secondly, not only did he have the authority, he also had the power. He could do things. And in his case, he did supernatural, stupendous things that no one else had ever done. So he establishes that the kingdom of God has both authority and it has power. So in the lives of these early disciples, the 12, the apostles, as they go forth now, there's no written New Testament. Jesus hadn't written down any of his words, nor he said anybody else to write them down. So they're going basically saying what Jesus has said to them. And some of the things that Jesus had taught them, he had taught them privately, remember? He would teach the parables to the masses. He would pull the apostles aside, and then he would give them the details and the specifics and the explanation. So there were some things that the apostles had heard from Jesus that Jesus had not taught anyone else. No one else had heard those things. So when they went out to preach and to teach, repeating what Jesus had said, there was no way for them to prove that what they were saying was after what Jesus told them. So what the Lord does, he gives them this supernatural power to do things that men just could not ordinarily do. And that gave veracity to them. That gave them veracity. It gave them believability. They are much like him. They preach and they teach with authority, but their authority is also accompanied by power, the ability to get certain things done. So the miracles, they were not spiritual show-offs. They were not doing this as some type of spiritual carnival, some gamesmanship. What this was was to authenticate them as bearers of the word of God. And so God credentials them. He deputizes them with the authority to speak his words. He credentials them with the power to get things done. And so as I would share with you over and over again, somewhere in the 21st century, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has to figure out how do we demonstrate that we have power. We can talk. All religions got holy books, and everybody's talking, but where is the power that accompanies our doctrine, our teaching? There has to be something that we do, some work that we do and we get done that credentials us as not only having authority, but having power that we have been deputized by Jesus Christ and his anointing is upon us, and we're not just a bunch of bonnie fights. We're not a bunch of bunny fights walking around here talking about we the deputy this, we the disciple this, we the Christian this, we the Christian that, but we are disciples of Jesus Christ and we are authenticated by our ability to do things, to serve, to help people, to speak into a life of a child and to give them hope to where they believe if they trust Jesus Christ and put him first, their life can be changed. To model the Christian life before young people to where they will aspire to be married and have families and bring up children and the nurture and then the admonition of the Lord. To have the courage to speak to the people in power when they do things that are basically and intrinsically oppressive to the least that are among us and have the courage to tell them that is not right, just like John the Baptist did when he told Herod, it's not right for you to take your brother Philip's wife. See, sometimes the power comes just from having courage. From just having the courage to speak the truth. So they go out declaring and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, demonstrating and displaying God's power. Thirdly, the third thing he does, that Jesus does, when he tells them that they were not to take money they were not to take food or bread, all of these things. It was not only so that the people understood what their priority was, 
but it was also that they would learn to depend upon and trust God's provision. He wanted them to learn to depend upon and to trust his provision. That as long as we're doing what God told us to do, in the way that God told us to do it, and the power in which God gives us to get it done, then God obligates himself to provide for us what we need. And sometimes God provides for us what we need through other people. And so when you go out here on your job and you're working, and yes, you're working for X, Y, Z company, and they got a president, a vice president, and they got shareholders and a board, but ultimately that is nothing more than God's way of providing for you. How God channels resources through companies and through corporations so they can employ and hire people, and one or two of those people, or some of those people they will hire and employ will be you. So God will provide for you sometimes indirectly through a business or a corporation in terms of how you haven't gotten a skill or a credential that allows you to be employed. But ultimately the good gift and the perfect gift comes from above, from the Lord God in heaven. Because God can shut companies down tomorrow if he chose, chooses to do it. And some of these companies owe their existence to Christians. The only reason God allows them to continue to be in business is because that's the way that he's choosing to provide to meet the needs of his people. Oh, I wish I could get some help. If you depend on him, if you trust him, if you lean not to your own understanding but all your ways acknowledge him, if you are committed to doing his will, he will provide for you even if he has to cater your meals into you by a scavenger raven bird and deliver them to you. He will make sure that you are provided for. If David here, he would testify and he would say, I was young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. He may not provide all of our greed, but he will meet all of our need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So he sends them out broke, busted, with no resources so that they can learn to depend upon him and trust in him and so they could see I can move in the hearts of other people to give to you, to help you. Look at what he says. Again, there in Matthew's gospel, verse 10. And also says to them, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place, and whoever will not receive you, you nor hear you, when you depart from there, shake off the dust from under your feet. So what the Lord was telling them, and I read that from, from Mark's gospel, Matthew gives a little more detail. He was telling them, I'm going to prepare people out there. I'm going to have people lined up out there. Now, if I wish I had the time and I could testify and tell the story of how God has prepared people and lined people up to help you, and you don't even know it. And he certainly prepared people and lined people up to help me. You see, so in, in, in my life, I, I see it more so than you see it because I'm dependent upon you to have a job and to work and to labor. So I'm praying to the Lord, please let the economy can pick up Lord, don't let the people lay nobody else off. Keep this thing going because I'm dependent upon you because you pay me. So I see how God works to provide for you so that you through your generosity can help provide for my family. And I'm grateful to the Lord for that and for each and every one of you who have done that faithfully and consistently ever since I've been here. So I understand how God provides and how God moves in the hearts of people. And I see it, and some of you could testify how God has moved in the heart of somebody else to be kind toward you, to be generous toward you. Oh, if you give me a minute, I, I will just testify. And I've shared this with you before, but not, it's been a long time since I shared it with you. You know, I'm good to children. I love children. They're the most precious people on the planet. And I believe the only reason that God leaves adults on the earth is so the adults can take care of the children because many adults have no other utility. But I'm good to cheat kids. And I'm good to children because I've got five of my own. I'm good to them. I'm good to kids. I got six grandchildren of my own. And I don't know if I'm going to be here to see all my grandchildren be grown. 
And in case the Lord chooses to take me out of here, I'm hoping I have enough equity in heaven's bank account that the Lord will say, you know what, Watts was good to kids. So I'm going to raise up somebody else to be good to his grandchildren, to help them. Or, and that's the way I'm going to bless his work and his labor. You better be careful of how you treat children, especially if you got kids of your own. If you got kids of your own, there's a good chance you're going to have grandchildren. If you want to see your heart really to be crushed, have to witness your grandchild being mistreated. And so you know, we never know what we're working for. We never know what we're laboring for. We really never know what we are investing in, who we're investing in, and how some kind of way God will then move somewhere down the road to bless someone that's associated with us. Well, I'm about through. They went out to declare and to preach the gospel. They were to demonstrate and display God's power. They were to depend upon and trust in God's provision. And fourthly and lastly, they had a hard job that they had to do. It was a very hard job. Look back at Mark chapter 6. And I think this is the hardest part of the Christian's job in a lot of ways. Verse 10, Mark 6. Also he said to them, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place. And whoever will not receive you, nor hear you, when you depart from there, shake the dust under your feet as a testimony. Shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. A sure lie say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. That's hard. That's hard. So the fourth thing he tells them is you have to declare and pronounce God's pending judgment. That's hard. They could not, they were not talking to Gentiles now. Remember Matthew said they couldn't go to the Gentiles. It was easy for the Jew to pronounce judgment upon the Gentiles. But they thought the Gentiles were heathens anyway. And they thought the Gentiles was undeserving of being in God's kingdom, undeserving of being in God's blessing. So it's easy for them to judge the Gentile, but Jesus sends them to their fellow Jews, and he says, if your fellow Jews will not receive you, and if they will not hear you, then when you get ready to leave, kick the dust off of your feet as a testimony against them. It is a testimony that you did all that you could do to bring the gospel to them. They rejected you and they rejected the gospel. So kick the dust off your feet as you leave because they now have sealed their own faith. Now this is hard. This is hard. Because it is hard for us to talk about a pending judgment. But this is not Paul writing. This is not... This is not Paul talking. This is Jesus himself saying. And what he says is utterly profound. He says it would be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah and the day of judgment than will be for those cities. Now, I wish I had time to fully develop this. But when you read the Bible closely, Jesus always talks about the judgment upon an entire city. That cities are going to be judged and they're going to be judged commensurate with the light that they have been exposed to. Commensurate with the illumination of the gospel. Commensurate with the truth that they have heard. So what is Jesus saying? He says, well, Sodom and Gomorrah, those decadent twin cities in the Old Testament, they had a little bit of light. But the only real light they had was a back slitting prophet by the name of Lot. That's the only light they had, but he was a light anyway, and he knew God, and Lot was inside of Sodom and Gomorrah when judgment came. And they were decadent, and they were wicked, and God in time rained fire down out of heaven to destroy and to consume the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. But what Jesus is suggesting here is that the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah will be resurrected to be judged again to receive their final judgment. And what he says here, it is hard for me to wrap my puny mind around. He says the cities like Nazareth, the cities like the capitalists, the cities like Capernaum, if they rejected the disciples, then when they stood before God 
their punishment will be more severe than the punishment for Sodom and Gomorrah because those cities had the revelation of Jesus himself. They had the revelation of his disciples and their witness and their testimony. This is the hardest thing we have to do as Christians. And it's something the church has to occasionally remind herself of. Our responsibility is to not solve all the social problems of the society. I think we should speak to them. I think we should speak to them clearly and succinctly. We should speak to the injustice in the juvenile injustice system and the way they're treating those children. They still deserve equal protection of the, under the law, which they have not been getting, and we ought to speak to the injustice in the juvenile justice system. We should speak to the injustice in the adult correctional system. We should speak to it. We shouldn't turn a deaf ear. As the church, we have to be the thundering prophet of God and say there is a certain level of dignity that every human being in this world should receive because they're created in the image of God, even those who we have to punish because they violate the law. We should speak to that. There's been almost mute silence in the church in West Virginia over the treatment of people in mental health hospitals. You very, you very seldom hear much about it until there's a crisis with over-incarceration. Someone gets hurt and you see an article in the newspaper and yes, the church will lift up our voice and say, wait a minute, people who are mentally incapacitated deserve a certain amount of care and treatment and we as the church ought to be speaking to those issues. Oh, we got a responsibility to speak to the issues of the day, not necessarily solve everything, but speak to the issues and to postulate solutions that make sense that makes sense. And as long as there's breath in my body and I got a tongue and vocal cords to speak, I will speak to this need for the church to stand up to try to bring some sanity to the insanity of the public school system because the majority of children, black, white, brown, blue, and purple in West Virginia are gonna be educated in the public school system and if we don't educate them to a certain level, we better all get, lock our houses up and bolt ourselves in because they're gonna take everything we got. So it's in our enlightened self-interest. Oh, this is our enlightened self-interest. I want to draw Social Security. I want to draw it as long as I live, and as soon as I get old enough to draw it, I'm going to apply for it. And somebody got to be working if I'm going to get mine out of the system. And I've been paying into it since I was 16 years old. I want something out of it. That's enlightened self-interest. So for me to get something out, somebody got to be working. A legal job, not one under the table, under the board. I mean, a legal one, see? when you're filing W-2s and that type of business, where they're keeping track of things. So the things that we speak to at our time, it's out of our, it helps us to do what's right. If we do what's right in the long term, it's always going to benefit us. So we can't solve every problem, but we can bring light and we can bring clarity where there is darkness, and we can say, well, what you're doing isn't working, is not working because it's not consistent with the word of the Lord, you might want to try something different. Well, let me close. It's hard to pronounce God's judgment on the nation that you love. It's hard to do it. You know, and, and we're teetering with things in our society. We can pass whatever law we want to pass. It don't make it right. What we got to understand is making something legal don't make it right before God. It can be legal, the Supreme Court can rule and they can justify, it don't mean that God is pleased with it. And so he says, there is a judgment. We might not want to admit it, but there is a judgment. Well, let me close as I promised. Four lessons we can remember from this text. Lesson number one, de declaring the gospel is the believer's priority. Sharing the gospel, sharing with people how we got saved and how they can get saved. It should be our ultimate priority. And we should be praying and asking the Lord to open doors to where we can tell people the good news of the gospel, the grace of God. Sharing the gospel, declaring it, is the believer's priority. Secondly, the demonstration of the gospel is the believer's privilege. We have the privilege to demonstrate the gospel, and we demonstrate the gospel when we're serving. 
when we're helping somebody. And the, the service that we do that we don't recognize as service, anybody who is an entrepreneur that has a business that's creating jobs, that's service. That's Christian service. They try to pay people fair and a decent wage for their employment. That's good Christian service. And so as a Christian, demonstrating the gospel is our privilege. Helping children, tutoring them, mentoring kids, I tip my hat to you. Those who go and visit people in the hospital, those who go to the convalescent homes, who go to hospice, that is the demonstration of the gospel. That is our privilege. That's our privilege. You know, I went up to see the girls play the other day. Uh, the the, the uh, Marsh University and WVU girls play. And Danny took a bunch of kids. Some of y'all went up and took them. And I, I took my grandson up. You know, and one of the things just a blessing to me, when I, when I came in the door, when I came in the door on my free ticket that Brother Kyler gave me, like, I like to go to places for free, y'all. I just feel good about it when I go for free. So I go in on my free ticket, and, I, and as soon as I come in the door, somebody rushes up to me and says, look, your man had 400 kids here today, and I didn't know they were having an event. As soon as I came in the door to the game, somebody came to me and said, your main man, Keith Tyler, had 400 kids here today who participated in the event where they heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's a privilege. That's service. We turn a basketball game in an opportunity where Christ is lifted up and all off the young people, many who otherwise would not hear. Demonstrating the gospel is our privilege. Depending upon God and trusting in the Lord is the believer's provision. That's where our provision ultimately is going to come from. Yes, I believe in the United States of America. I believe everything that we stand for in the Constitution and in the Bill of Rights. And yes, I believe this is the greatest experience under heaven in the history of man because the freedom it gives to the individuals has been recognized as coming from God himself. And we can make this a more perfect union, but in the end, everything we have comes from the Lord. All the rights we have come from him. All the blessings we have come from him. So the believers, depending upon God, is the way we demonstrate our faith because he provides our provision. And then lastly, declaring God's pending judgment is the believer's paradox. It's the believer's paradox. And I want you young people to listen. This is a good word. This is a good word for you to know. You can impress your teacher. When your teacher say, well, uh, Amicio, uh, I need for you to do these problems I and mean, do this and that and that, you say, well, that's a paradox. <laughs> and she'll be blown away when you tell her that it's a paradox. You say, well, I wonder where he get that word from. A paradox is an apparent contradiction. It's an apparent contradiction. So, for example, if I would say uh, the real skinny fat man, that's a paradox. How can a man be real skinny and real fat? That is a contradiction. It's an apparent contradiction. How can it be that? How can it be a, a skinny fat man? That's a contradiction. That's what a paradox is. Something appears to be a contradiction. So our contradiction is we go out and we preach that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever will leave him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but the world through him might be saved. We talk about the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the kindness of God, the beneficence of God, the giving of God. We talk about how wonderful God is and then we turn around and say, but he's a consuming fire. That's a paradox. It's our paradox. How do we explain that? How can we explain that a God of love and mercy and a God of forgiveness is also a God with a flaming sword in his mouth and will bring judgment on the unbeliever? That is our paradox. It's a paradox that we must not try to explain away. That becomes heresy. We destroy the faith when we try to explain something that is difficult for us to explain. And we let the paradox be right there in tension. God is a God of love, mercy, and grace, and forgiveness. How do you know? Because I have experienced it. So I know that for a fact. I know he's a God of love. I know he's a God of mercy. I know he's a God of forgiveness. I know he's a God of grace. I can testify that. That part of the paradox I can stand up and testify for. And you say, but by faith, he also says he's a God of judgment. I'm glad I haven't experienced it. I don't want to experience it. I don't want you to experience it either. That's why I'm sharing to you about his love. So our, our paradox, our dilemma, is how do we hold these true, two truths in tension? 
and how we present them in a balanced way. And that's one of the reasons that I try to be, and I fumble bumble through it, but I try to be a biblical expositor. I'm just trying to, this is what the Bible says. I'm going, next week I'm going to read the next paragraph. So every time judgment comes in the Bible and the gospel, we're going to deal with it. Every time hell comes up in the Bible, we're going to deal with it. So it brings balance to how the Bible is put together. It brings balance to how it's put together. So we can't just ignore things that the Bible says because it's convenient to ignore it and because it makes people mad when you talk about it. But we present it in its balance. And there's much more in the Bible about God's love and mercy and God's forgiveness. So we should talk more about God's love, God's mercy, and God's forgiveness. But we must add the balance. But it also says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And that our God is a consuming fire. So these lessons hopefully will help us to be balanced during this Christmas season as we have the opportunity to tell people about the goodness of the Lord and the grace of God and the forgiveness of God and the mercy of God and how this season uniquely presents us this opportunity to lift up Jesus Christ as the hope of the world. Amen? Amen. As the hope of salvation, as the hope of forgiveness. And so I just encourage all of you here this morning the sound of my voice, if the Lord says the same, allows us to continue to inhale and to exhale, for the next seven days and brings us back to this place, I would encourage let's bring people with us. You young people, try to get your mothers, your fathers, your brothers, your cousins, your sisters, your aunts, tell them to come to see you in the Christmas program on next Sunday. God might use you to bring the gospel to your family. I would encourage the rest of you to do the same thing. At a time of the year that Jesus Christ is supposed to be the focus of all the activity there's probably less clear articulation of the gospel. And let us not be guilty of doing that. As I close, I get up every Sunday morning. And I want you to understand, I don't get here late because I don't get here in time. Like, yeah, I get up at 6 o'clock. If I'm not up by 6 o'clock in my house, they're ready to call 911. Because I'm an early riser. I've delivered newspapers since I was nine, nine years old. I've been getting up about, about, about 5.30 ever since I was nine. I never used an alarm clock. I'm going to wake up. That's just the way my body is, is rhythm. I pray for you. I pray over the message. I go to that radio station every Sunday morning. Every Sunday morning, I go to that radio station to lift my voice one more time to this greater Kenora Valley, to lift up the name of Jesus Christ, to pray for people, to give people hope. Because one of these days, I'm going to shake the dust off my feet. And I want to be, be able to say in a, with a clear heart and conscience, I did everything I could. I did everything that I could so that people could hear the gospel clearly, succinctly, and that there was an effort made to demonstrate that people really mattered and people really counted. I'm done. Look, P.S., this week, I get letters all the time from the penitentiaries. Federal penitentiaries in Beckley, on one side of the federal penitentiary, they can hear 98.7 on the radio. And these guys write. I write some of them back. I can't write them all. But this week, was I got two letters from the uh, Mount Olive Penitentiary. Two letters uh, from two inmates that are in Mount, Mount Olive. And they were greatly encouraging to me what they actually wrote. And what they wrote was, was in response to a couple of articles I've written in the Charleston Gazette. And in essence, what they were saying that we're glad that at least there's one preacher who thinks that we're still human beings. We might be locked up, we're not all animals in here. And most of us are gonna get out. As a matter of fact, 95% of us are gonna get out and return to neighborhoods and return to communities. The thing was encouraging to me is that these inmates recognize there's a few people out here that realize that everybody still needs a chance to hear the gospel and everybody needs a chance to be treated like they are human beings, even those whom we got to lock up. And don't, 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 don't get it wrong now. Don't get it twisted. 
But there are some people that I would go up there and hold on to the lock and make sure they don't let them out. Don't let them out. Just hold them up in here. I'll take a couple more locks and change is necessary. Oh, don't think that I'm not some law and order type guy. I've written letters to the parole board saying, don't let that person out. They do not deserve to come back into our neighborhood. They hurt too many people too often. If you send them somewhere else, don't send them back here. But at the same time, human beings, create the image of God, has to be shown a certain level of dignity and respect. Otherwise, you create animals who have minds to think about more and greater mischief. So let us be mindful of doing this holiday season. People need to hear the gospel. We're the vessel to share it. And let's seize every opportunity we can to tell somebody about Jesus Christ. I'm out of my time. I thank you for yours. Father, we thank you for another opportunity to be together around your word with your people.